Hello and welcome to today's virtual field trip, diving into the world of coral restoration. My name is Jacqueline Duracus and I'm the Expeditions Manager with Earth Echo International. We are a nonprofit founded on the belief that youth have the power to change the planet. Our free programs and resources have reached more than 2 million people in 146 countries. I wanted to remind everyone that you can send in questions anytime today for our amazing host, JD, and we will get those answers throughout the event today. If you're joining us here in the Zoom, please use the Q&A feature. And if you're watching on YouTube, please go ahead and use the comments section to ask those questions. So it's my pleasure to introduce you all to JD Reinbat, who's the volunteer coordinator with the Coral Restoration Foundation. JD, can you tell us more about yourself and the amazing work you do to restore our corals? Of course. So like Jacqueline just said, my name is JD and I am currently the volunteer coordinator here at the Coral Restoration Foundation. We are going to spend a lot of time today talking about who we are as an organization and the amazing work that we do to restore the critically endangered ecosystem that can be found off of the coast of Florida. Um, as Jacqueline was saying, please ask as many questions as you would like, because I am happy to discuss anything that you want to be further addressed. Um, but with all that being said, I will go ahead and share my screen and start talking to you all a little bit more about what we, what we do here at CRF. Cool, so can everyone see that, this slide? <laughs> Great. Awesome, so coral reefs themselves are these amazing ecosystems, but in case you were unaware, there is a lot that is going on, to them, or going on with them beneath the sea. So in short, for the past 500 million years, coral reef ecosystems have persisted in shallow seas. They are arguably these areas of immense biodiversity. And everyone always talks a lot about the fact that rainforests are the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. And I always like to challenge that and say that coral reefs have them beat. And, ooh, excuse me. And these reef systems themselves perform a, a variety of vital ecosystem services. And you can see in this picture on the left, this beautiful thicket or colony of staghorn coral. As a diver, I would love to spend my entire hour long dive staring at every single one of these polyps that can be found on this colony. But unfortunately, our reefs really aren't looking like this anymore. Since the 1970s, reefs around the world have rapidly degraded at this extremely fast pace. You can see now in this picture on the right, the exact same space that we saw previously. But instead of this vibrant, beautiful coral reef, it is now, for the lack of better words, this algal graveyard where you can see all of these dead skeletons of that staghorn coral that are now dead on the bottom of the ocean floor and being overgrown by algae. Reef systems themselves are one of the most threatened habitats that you can find on our planet. And more specifically, looking at stony corals, the corals that actually contribute and build to the skeleton of our reef ecosystems are at the most risk for facing extinction in the near future. Now I just touched upon those vital ecosystem services that coral reefs provide for us as human beings. On a global scale, we can talk about the fact that at least 500 million people rely on coral reefs for food, coastal protection and their livelihoods overall. And these reefs again, on a global scale, have an estimated economic value of at least $9.9 .9 trillion. Now, again, I can never fully wrap my head around that number. I don't think anyone currently sitting in this call will ever see that much money in their life, but you can again, imagine the economy that is built up by these reef systems. But as I've been talking a lot about, these reefs aren't really doing so well. We have actually lost roughly 50% of the world's coral reefs in the last 30 years. Now sitting here right now, I'm only 24 years old. So the idea of another 50% bringing us up to 100% of those corals being gone in roughly my lifetime yet again is a very scary thought. And in fact, in the next 80 years, all shallow water coral reefs could actually become extinct. So when you go out, you will only see pictures like this out on the reef. You will only ever see a beautiful, colorful coral colony in a picture, in an aquarium, or somewhere online. 
but we kind of like to zoom in a bit further. I'm currently calling you all from the Florida Keys where Coral Restoration Foundation is based. And we get the pleasure of working in and out on the Florida reef tracks. Now this reef system is the third largest barrier reef system on the planet. We obviously have the first largest, which is the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia. The second largest known as the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef off of Mexico and Belize. And we have this beautiful treasure down here off of the coast of Florida. It's actually the only barrier reef that we can find within the continental United States. So bringing it back to that idea of this natural wonder and this treasure for us down here in the Keys. And on average, it's roughly 360 miles long. It goes all the way up into Miami-Dade County and stretches all the way down past the Dry Tortugas National Park. So it is a lot of reef. Now again, circling back to those vital ecosystem services, we can see that this Florida reef tract, first and foremost, helps protect our coastline. We are famous for our coral down here in the Keys, but we are also very famous for our hurricanes. And by having a healthy reef ecosystem, they can actually help baffle and protect the coastline from that storm surge when we get hit with another storm. These reefs are also a habitat for fish that are targeted by both recreational and commercial fisheries. So bringing food to your plate and individuals going out to go fishing for fun. And kind of in conjunction with that, we can talk about the fact that the Florida Reef Tract underpins our tourism industry down here in the Keys. It is a playground for people like myself who love to go diving and snorkeling and see all the really cool critters and the octopus and the sharks and the rays and everything else that we can find on this reef system. But again, just like we were talking about on that global scale and now zooming in, we can see that in the last 40 years, the Florida reef tract itself has lost roughly 97% of the once dominant reef building coral species known as elkhorn and staghorn coral. Now again, let that number sit in, That's 97%. There is only 3% of that elkhorn and staghorn coral sitting along that entire 360 miles of coral reef. Something needs to be done. And if you aren't already unsettled by this conversation, this die-off is happening on a global level. What we are currently seeing happen to the Great Barrier Reef is what has already happened to us down here in the Keys. That's kind of setting a picture or an example of what's going to happen to the Great Barrier Reef, to the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, to every other single reef that we can find on the planet. And to help drive this point home even further, we're gonna go ahead and look at a case study. We're gonna go ahead and look at Cary's Fort Reef. Now Cary's Fort Reef used to be known as the crown jewel of the Florida Keys. You can see in this image from 1975, this beautiful picturesque image. As a diver, I would saw off my left arm or my left leg to get the chance to go out and see a beautiful reef like this. This elkhorn coral in the picture is probably roughly six feet high. It has a lot of 3D space, otherwise known as rugosity, that gives the area or habitat for smaller fish to live in. With your small fish, you get your big fish. With your big fish, you get your charismatic megafauna, like your sharks and your rays and your dolphins. You can see that that visibility is pretty good, so you can get all the really nice pictures underwater, and it's honestly just a beautiful place to be. Jumping ahead just 10 years later, this is the exact same reef. You can see that there is still some coral on the left and the right of that image, but a lot of that structure and that height has been lost. You really can't see any life besides the you know, dying coral in the image, and that visibility has drastically reduced. Not the worst thing to go diving on, but you probably wouldn't wanna spend all your money to come down to the Keys and come see this. Jumping ahead yet again, we're gonna come up to another picture at 2004. I really can't find any coral here. There's really nothing to be seen. There may be one or two small little coral colonies holding on for dear life, but the majority of it is gone. And coming to our most recent picture on this super fun journey through Cary's Fort Reef, sitting at a picture from 2014, it's now transitioned from that once beautiful area to, again, an algal graveyard. So that's kind of setting the stage for what we need to do as an organization here at CRF. Before I kind of dive into that aspect and talk more about the work that we do as the world's largest restoration nonprofit organization, are there any questions about what's happening or what's causing that die off or anything that maybe someone wanted me to kind of address further?
And if not, no hard feelings. Sure, JD. So we did have a question coming in from Jenna in Dunedin, Florida. And awesome. she would like to know, um, how do scientists value a reef? So how do they assign the value that you were talking about with the economy and all of that? So it comes through a variety of different metrics. Um, you can kind of get your example per se from the idea, let's say someone like myself is currently flying down from New Jersey where I'm from to come dive here. I spend the money on you know, the flight for my, air, my airplane ticket. I spend the money on my Uber from Miami airport down here to the Keys. I then spend all my money and my time you know, eating, staying at a hotel, giving money to those dive shop operators. So basically they take a lot of different metrics based on what individuals will pay to get down here and then use that to kind of help quantify the overall net worth of our reef ecosystems. The exact same thing can kind of be said through those commercial fisheries and everything else that kind of comes from those vital ecosystem services, if that makes sense. That makes sense, very interesting. Um, so Cindy in North Dakota wants to know, uh, what can those who live so far away from the ocean do to help corals? Yeah, so even if you're not directly connected to a reef ecosystem, you can still have some form of a positive impact on it. Um, everyone always thinks, well, hi, I'm currently living in a landlocked state, or you know, I'm nowhere close to any form of a reef. What I do doesn't matter. But I kind of always pull back to the quote from uh, Finding Nemo saying, all drains lead to the ocean. So even if you're in the middle of the US, if you are being more conscious about you know, your plastic usage, if you are being more conscious about what you're eating and the overall emissions that you're having in your life, you can again have some sort of connection back to the ocean and thus a connection back to our reefs. So the biggest thing that I always say is just become a little bit more eco-conscious, whether you're bringing you know, reusable grocery bags to the store, if you're bringing your own reusable straws, if you, you know, you're biking to work or walking to work or taking some form of public transit, small little steps are better than not doing anything at all. And you may think that doing one small little thing is not really worth it, but if every single human being on the planet makes one small adjustment to their daily lifestyle, it really does add up. For sure, thank you. No, that's definitely true. So we did have a question, we'll do one more and then yep. um, we'll come back at the end. So thank you so much for submitting questions. You guys can continue to submit them. But Ella would like to know what sort of fish are common that live in coral? In coral as in like in the area or like inside the coral itself? I'm thinking in the coral reef. Yeah, um, that is honestly such a loaded question. There are so many fish. Um, you can have everything from barracuda, you can have eels, you can have nurse sharks, you can have sergeant majors, you can have angelfish, you can have surgeon fish. Pretty much any fish that you can probably think of has some sort of connection back to the reef. Awesome, thank you so much. So again, we'll come back for questions um, after you tell us a little bit more about the restoration part of what you do. Definitely. So here at CRF, we are in fact the world's largest nonprofit marine conservation organization dedicated to restoring coral reefs to a healthy state, primarily down here in Florida, but also on a global level. Our core mission is one, to restore our coral reefs, kind of a given, two, to educate others on the importance of our oceans, and three, to use science to further coral research and coral reef monitoring techniques. But we do in fact believe that large scale massive action is required in order to save the world's coral reefs. As of right now, we're currently sitting with roughly 16 staff members. We have about 20 interns and we have a volunteer base of 200 plus. That is not enough. We need every single human being on the planet actively taking some part, whether it's they're physically down here in person or turning these critically endangered corals back to the reef or again, coming back to it and sounding like a broken record, living in the middle of a landlocked state and just using reusable grocery bags. We need every single human being doing something to help save our reefs. And now we can really talk about the cool part and this is how we actually do it. Our primary focus is growing and outplanting that of staghorn and elkhorn coral, but we also do focus on two species of boulder coral. On the right, the top picture is that of our boulder corals. The middle picture is that of staghorn coral. And the bottom picture is that of elkhorn coral. Now staghorn and elkhorn coral are actually listed on the IUCN red list of endangered species as critically endangered. 
That means that they are basically one step away from being extinct in the wild. Now, those who know me know that my favorite animal on the planet is an octopus. And my second favorite animal on the planet is elkhorn coral. And the idea of going on a dive and never seeing elkhorn coral ever again is really, really scary. But in total, we do have 11 different species that we grow in culture in our coral nurseries. When we first started, we actually would have to go out and collect these corals from wild colonies. But I'm really happy to say that our coral tree nurseries are now self-sufficient. We have so much coral that the running joke is sometimes we don't always know what to do with it. And we grow these corals through a process that is known as propagation. Now I know everyone has kind of probably been stuck in quarantine these past few months. So I know during my time in quarantine, I picked up uh, houseplants. I went from having one houseplant to over a hundred. So pretty much imagine your corals as your houseplants. And when you cut off one little part and put it in some more water to help propagate and grow it, that's basically what we're doing with our corals. But instead of potting it in a pot and soil, we are now bringing them back out onto the reef. The amazing thing with these uh, nurseries is the fact that some of the genotypes that we have in our nursery are no longer existing in the wild. And we grow our corals on these structures that for the lack of better words are just called coral trees. These structures are actually recognized as one of the best methods for growing large quantities of certain species of coral really, really fast. Uh, so what you can see in this image is that there are roughly 60 coral fragments on every single one of these structures. So what I want everyone to do who's currently listening is to look at this image and pick your favorite coral. I sometimes go with the one on the top left because it looks like a chicken foot, but you can also pick the chicken foot that's on the bottom left or some other random coral. I'll give you all like five seconds. And what we're going to do now is go ahead and jump to that exact same tree just nine months later. You can't really find your coral. It's basically this explosion of growth that happens underwater. In fact, this growth is calculated to actually have to be two to three times faster than what would happen in a natural reef setting. But with these trees, it's not just this one tree. It's not just a dozen trees. It's this entire coral tree nursery. You can see in this image, every single one of those dots is a coral tree. The kind of weird long rectangles is a live rock farm. And then you can also see some of those that look like a bit like a satellite. Those are boulder coral trees. That image is of our Tavernier nursery, which is based in Tavernier, Florida. And it is actually the world's largest coral tree nursery. Uh, this nursery itself contains more than 500 coral trees. It covers over an acre and a half of seafloor. And as you can imagine, if there are 60 corals on 500 trees, we have more than 30,000 corals that we can grow and cultivate. But that's just one of our nurseries. In total, we own and operate seven different coral tree nurseries. So you can imagine there's even more coral than those 30,000 fragments. Now, once those corals do get big enough, we start the next process of actually bringing them back to the reef. In 2018 and 2019, we focused primarily on eight different reef restoration sites throughout the entire Florida Keys. You can see that we have four up in the Northern Keys, two in the Middle Keys, and two in the Lower Keys. Once we kind of recognize that the corals in our nursery are quote unquote reef ready, we go through with some pliers and actually cut down fragments from the trees themselves. And we also, again, leave parts of the coral growing in the tree so they can continue to grow and propagate and form more corals for us to harvest later on. And we transport them in these super scientific milk crates. And we bring them out on our work boats to those reef restoration sites. And once we get to those reef restoration sites, we go underwater with a hammer and marine epoxy and we start to clear the substrate itself. Now you're probably thinking, JD, you're talking about being a reef restoration organization and you can see in this image, there is someone hitting the reef with a hammer. We are not hitting other corals. We are not chasing after and hitting other fish. We are just hitting the dead limestone substrate of the reef itself to help remove any algal overgrowth. We then mix that two-part marine epoxy to help activate it underwater. It's totally non-toxic. It has no side effects to any of the organisms in the area. And we attach the coral using that epoxy. 
roughly 40 minutes later, that epoxy will cure and harden and will basically solidify those corals back on the reef. And we outplant these corals in clusters of seven to 10. Those clusters of seven to 10 are all gonna be the exact same genotype. So those corals over time will grow and fuse and start to uh, form that exact same thicket that we saw in that very first image. And the best part of all of this is the fact that it does work and we do have the data that shows it. The biggest question we often get is, well, do you just leave your corals out there once you outplant them and kind of forget about them? And that couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth. That's pretty much what our entire science program is for. We had our traditional method where we would go out and have to find every single coral outplant. And uh, fun fact, these outplant sites on average have 1500 corals on them. So it definitely takes a bit of time. We'd have to take pictures of every single one. And then we'd also have to record data on every single one. And we found that our survivorship after one year of outplanting is sitting around 77%. Not the best, not the worst. I know with me in college, I would probably take a C plus on a paper, but you always want to strive for more. But we have actually recently undergone some drastic changes within our science program. And we now use this process known as photomosaics. With photomosaics, we have one of our staff members swim over the reef site with two GoPros that take a picture every second. All of those pictures are then combined in this fancy schmancy software that is able to stitch all those pictures together to form this underwater map of our reef that we can see on the right. These photos are high resolution, so we can actually zoom in very close and actually find each individual coral outplant on that reef site. We can collect data on survivorship and how they're actually doing and record all of that so we can become even more accurate than what we were doing previously. And we also do a lot of collaboration with other research partners. And you can see right here, this is a healthy staghorn thicket. These used to be outplanted corals. There used to be 10 individual coral fragments all sitting next to each other on the reef, but they have since grown and fused together and formed this really beautiful image underwater. And the best part is to show the overall success of our outplants and how healthy they truly are, our corals have actually been seen spawning after they're outplanted. Now spawning is extremely energetically expensive. So if these corals are not happy, if the ocean is too acidic, if the ocean is too warm, they are most likely not going to spawn. And we are really seeing these corals spawn pretty much every single year. So it really does show the overall health and success that our corals do have. So I know we were talking a little bit about Carysport earlier on and it was all those super upsetting and sad pictures. This is an Elkhorn cluster after one year of being outplanted out on Carysport Reef. Now, admittedly, it's definitely not the biggest, but it could still grow and it's still there. It's better than nothing before. You can see that it's slowly starting to cement and skirt itself back onto the limestone itself. And you can see to the left and the right of that cluster, there are still other corals growing. So we can see that there is new growth amongst old mortality and that ecosystem level recovery is possible. And you can see again in this picture, all of these corals were outplanted by us here at CRF. And you can see that these new corals are growing over the previous skeletons of elkhorn corals that used to be there before. And since our organization was first founded, we have actually returned over 120,000 coral fragments back to the wild. Hitting upon Carrie's Fort, you can see on the left, there are some corals roughly nine months after being outplanted on the reef. And that exact same image two years later, you can see the explosion of growth and how healthy those corals really are doing. And now the best part is talking a little bit more about the ways that you can get involved with our organization. I'm sure some of you are probably hearing all of these really cool things. I know I see a few volunteers and volunteer applicants in the participant list, but you can definitely get involved. First and foremost, if you are only down here in the Keys for a short period of time, and just kind of want to get a taste of the work that we do, you can actually come out and become a recreational dive program participant with us. These programs are one day recreational adventures where you get a morning of education followed up by afternoon dives where you can see the Tavernier Nursery or the Carries Fort Nursery and then actually help outplant these corals back to the reef. We have a multitude of different citizen science opportunities for you to get further involved with us. And then we also do have a volunteer program. Unfortunately, with COVID, the volunteer program itself has been on hold since uh, the 
middle of March. And we're constantly working to kind of get a more estimated timeline on when those activities will resume. But with the volunteer program, you're pretty much doing everything that you can put your mind to. You will be out with our restoration team, returning corals back to the reef. You'll be out with the science team, assisting with monitoring. You can be working those dive programs and helping you know, educate individuals who have no idea what a coral is. And you can be doing a lot of other scientific data entry. You can help us with any of the construction of our coral trees or really anything else that comes with the management of a restoration organization. And I also like to mention that we do have an internship program as well that's not currently on this list, but the internship is an amazing opportunity. Speaking from experience before my time as a full-time staff member here at CRF, I was previously an intern and it definitely really got me solidified in the field of coral restoration. So the ways to get involved are definitely not in short supply. And you can also keep in touch with us here at CRF. If you find yourself down here in the Keys, you can stop in for a visit at our Exploration Center, which can be found at 5 Seagate Boulevard in Key Largo, Florida. You can follow our mission as it evolves by signing up for Coral Chronicles. This is a weekly email list that kind of gets sent out to give you some updates on what's happening within our organization. And you can also join us on social media. We have our website at coralrestoration.org. We have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. But that is everything that I have for you guys to give you that kind of brief overview of the world of restoration. And I'm more than happy to discuss any other questions that you may all have. Awesome, thank you so much, JD. I'm so glad that uh, Carrie's Fort Reef has a happier future than those first photographs. That's yeah. excellent. <laughs> thank you for sharing that with us. So we did have a question from YouTube um, and that is why does the coral tree grow the coral more quickly? So with that, we are able to suspend our corals up in the water column. And with that, it kind of gives corals 360 degrees of space to grow and room to breathe for the lack of better words. Uh, with them not being on the substrate, they don't have to worry as much about algal competition. There is still some algal growth that happens on the coral trees themselves. So our team does routinely go out with fancy toilet bowl brushes and chisels to help remove all the algae that's growing on those trees. But also by being up in the water column, they're not uh, at risk of running into things like fireworms and other organisms that may eat them. And then those trees are suspended on tethers. So we can actually move the height of the corals themselves. So in the summer months, when the top of the water column gets a lot warmer, we can actually lower them so they're not too hot. And then in the colder months, when it gets a little bit colder on the bottom of the ocean floor, we can actually lift them up so they're in a um, warmer temperature zone. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Robert, and that is, um, other than funding, what challenges are there um, for scaling up the restoration? How do you get production large enough to restore the iconic reefs? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it just comes down to getting individuals aware of what's going on. I think one of the biggest hurdles that we face as restoration is individuals not fully recognizing what is happening to our reefs. Uh, so obviously working on ways to get the public more involved, whether it's coming out with us on those type of programs or just getting them more conscious of the repercussions that their actions can or cannot have. Um, you can also then couple it with things like getting funding from governmental organizations, you know, getting the further expansion of an organization because building, you know, us up more definitely takes a bit of time. So it's definitely a multitude of different compounding factors that limit us, but we're definitely working every single day to help overcome those and find the best ways to, you know, further advance our organization. Excellent. And so Donna wants to know, um, the corals on the trees, is there a reason that they, uh, don't die from the warming water just like the original coral on the reef did. So what's the difference between that original habitat and then the coral tree? Um, it kind of ties back to us being able to help mitigate and control those overall parameters. So admittedly, sometimes there may be a little bleaching in some parts of those corals and ultimately it does come down to the set genotype. So some corals are more resistant to coral bleaching while other ones are not so much. So it definitely still happens, but again, with us being able to help mitigate and control those parameters, we're able to significantly reduce the overall chances of bleaching itself. Excellent. Could you tell us a little bit more about the citizen science program that you have, um, specifically yeah. the app that you have? So OK Coral is an app that basically allows you to go out when you are out on a recreational dive boat or a recreational snorkel boat and you're not explicitly with us as an organization. 
what you can do is, for the lack of better words, it's basically like Tinder, but for corals. So you will have to take three different tests where you're swiping left or swiping right on different images. The first is whether it's staghorn or elkhorn coral. The, first, the next is whether it's bleached or not bleached. And then the other one is whether it's fused or not fused. Once you have passed all three of those tests, you can then actually go out and take pictures of those corals that you see that on our outplanting sites, submit them through that app and actually kind of help us take place with that data and scientific monitoring effort. So it's a really cool way to kind of get further involved while not explicitly being out with us on a work boat or on a recreational dive program. That's great. How exciting. Um, so we did have a question about the sites and that is, um, can anyone come visit the sites with you? So that's a little tricky. Um, we don't really kind of run set trips to set designated sites. It really kind of depends on the operator. So speaking a little bit more about those recreational dive programs, um, if you were to run with a shop that is more in the northern Key Largo area, you'll probably be going to Cary's Fort Reef and then you'll be going to Cary's Fort Nursery. If you go through someone more in like the lower um, Key Largo area, you may be going out to Tavernier Nursery and then going somewhere like Pickles Reef. And then if you were to be doing something down in Key West, you'll go to our Key West Nursery and then go out to Marker 32. So with those set recreational dive programs, there are kind of set corresponding outplant sites that we go to with them. Very cool. Uh, this is an interesting question about coral anatomy. Does mm -hmm. coral have roots? So not per se roots, but what they kind of do is skirt over the reef. So in that one of those last images, you could kind of see how there was the coral that was growing up and then it was cementing this base out. So that's their roots for the lack of better words, but it's more so an, a base that they create to help attach themselves to the reef as they grow and as they expand. But I think sometimes like the propagation and like referring it to plants makes them seem like they're plants sometimes. So I can totally get where that's coming from. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important to remember that coral is, is an animal, not a yeah. plant. When we're talking about out planting and things like that, it gets a little confusing, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so JD, can you, could you grow coral in a tank um, and then have it be translate, transplanted and donated to your organization or do you all take the growing part and do that? Yeah. So we unfortunately don't have the capacity right here and now to accept any type of corals that are grown uh, outside of our organization. There are definitely other organizations that do restoration efforts that first cultivate their corals in tanks on land and then outplant them themselves. But with us here at CRF, we primarily focus just on our in-water nurseries. And we love the idea that people want to obviously grow corals and help us, but unfortunately just based on permitting and other kind of restrictions that have been put in place based on the conservation status of these corals, we really can't accept corals from other individuals. But thank you for asking. Makes sense. Uh, so we have one more question from Donna, and that is what parameters can, um, do you control on the uh, coral trees, aside from the genetics uh, of the coral itself, that would make them resistant to uh, the warmer water and, and bleaching from the warmer water? Um, so really, the only other thing with that is just being able to move them up and down in the water column. Um, we have over 322 different genotypes across those 11 species. So we may have some that are not as resistant to bleaching and we will have some that are more resistant to bleaching. But all in all, it's more so just really kind of working with them and moving them up and down based on what time of year we are currently finding ourselves in. All right, this might, I don't know. You might know the answer to this. I personally don't. And that's <laughs> how many different types of coral are there? Oh my God, that's a really good question. Oh, I know it's a lot, right? <laughs> the answer in brief, a lot. <laughs> there are, I mean, I think there's roughly 60 or 70 different types of species of coral that can be found in the Caribbean. And the Caribbean is the like least biodiverse coral ecosystem that you can find. And when you go out to the Pacific, I think it's, in the hundreds plus. So there are a fair amount of different species. Because you have like your hard corals, you have your soft corals, you have your branching corals, your boulder corals, your massive corals. So there are so many different types of corals out there. 
Awesome, great question. Um, and so uh, we'll wrap up our question with uh, one more from Asher who is five years old. Uh, and they would like to know how often can corals spawn? Uh, so corals normally only spawn once a year. Uh, it very much depends on the set species and it also depends on the location that you're going to find yourself in. But it's normally just once a year. It can kind of span across a multitude of different days. Some kind of spawn all at once and you have one day to go out and see it where other corals will spawn, you know, over three or four or five days. Uh, but it's a really cool experience. I always equate it to being in a snow globe, but you're underwater um, and with them, they don't fully really know how the corals communicate with one another. It's not like there's like a polyp next to each other and they kind of are like, hey, it's time to go, let's do it. But you'll sit there underwater watching them and you can see the gametes slowly coming out of the polyps themselves. And then it's like they just all snap their fingers and they all just go off at once. It's a really, really cool experience. And I would say if you ever get the chance to be able to see it underwater, I would highly recommend it. Sounds beautiful. I hope I get to see that one day. <laughs> thank you so much, JD. And thank you for sharing all of that wonderful information about corals with us. Um, we're kind of running out of time, so we're going to wrap up. But JD, I was wondering, um, we did have a question about the email, the contact email for you all. So I wanted to put up your social information. Could you go over that email one more time they shared? Yeah. Um, let me pull that up right now. So. Sure. Are they talking more so about Coral Chronicles or just like more so a way of reaching out and touching base with us? I believe the Coral Chronicles. Cool. So with Coral Chronicles, what you'll want to do is to go on over to our website, which you can see on the screen right now, which is coralrestoration.org. You can scroll all the way down to the bottom of that page and there will be a little pop-up that comes up that says sign up for Coral Chronicles. You'll enter, I think it's just your name, in your email and then it automatically will add you to that email list and we'll start getting those emails as soon as we send stuff out. Awesome, thank you. Cool. Uh, and I'd like to encourage everybody to follow along with Coral Restoration Foundation um, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Again, you can follow along with Earth Echo on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'd also encourage everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get alerts when we go live with exciting events like this one. Uh, we have another event coming up next week, so make sure you subscribe and join us for that. And on behalf of Earth Echo and all of us, we would like to say thank you so much for joining us today. Stay safe, uh, stay safe and keep exploring, everybody. Bye. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you so much.